Sebo, Niabo, Oliotia. Hello, everyone. My name is Prima Sukmanop, and that was a language called Luganda. Now, the reason I was speaking in one of the 50 tribal languages of a small East African country called Uganda is because last summer, I spent two months living there in a rural village as a volunteer. But before I go ahead and tell you of the things I was experiencing in Uganda and the lessons that this country has taught me, let's talk about how I got there in the first place, my motivation. So ever since I was a child, I've always had a dream of visiting Africa one day because I grew up reading this series of comics. It's in Thai, and it's called Patson Paine Trip Africa, or Adventures in Africa. It's, it's a comic about this family whose plane crashed somewhere along Lake Victoria, and they had to go through like a life or death journey in the safaris, in the jungles, and somehow ended up in a tribal village. But yeah, this, this story became such an important part of my childhood that my 10-year-old self made a promise to me that one day I need to have an African adventure of my own. And that dream did come true. But another important reason is that I realized not everyone has such a positive view of Africa as I do. I realized there is this sense of stigmatization that people would automatically label onto this entire continent. And these people, it's often the people who has absolutely no experience with Africa, or people whose only experience with Africa is limited to phrases like, finish your food, honey, there are starving children in Africa. And I feel like it's not going to be that bad out there. And a part of me says that I have to go there and prove them wrong. To make my motivation more clear to you, let's talk about the United States. So I spent one year of high school in a state called Virginia, United States, as an exchange student. And my American, American classmates couldn't really tell that I was foreign because I didn't have an accent. But once they do find out that I'm actually from a different part of the world, they would react with re a lot of excitement and start saying things like, oh my god, you're so exotic. And the conversation goes downhill from there. They would then ask me questions like, are there cars in Thailand? Are there buildings in Thailand? How do you know how to use a cell phone if you're from Thailand? And the most classic one of all, do you ride elephants to school? <laughs> and it was something quite unbelievable for me, because come on, like, how is your world so limited? How do you not know about what's out there in this great big world? And more importantly, why do you keep relying on these assumptions of yours? But then I realized that a lot of Thai people view Africa the same way that these Americans view Thailand. Now, I'm not denying that there are no problems in Africa. It's a whole new world out there, and it's a parallel universe even. Poverty, inequality, lack of opportunities, all these words didn't really mean that much to me outside of my legal text. But they all came to light the first moment I set foot into this little village in Uganda. A familiar sight you can see in the village would be of young children carrying a giant water jerk and at least half their body weight just to go fetch water from somewhere else because there's no running water at home. And the young children in Uganda, in my village, they're not just young children. By the age of four, nearly every children know how to manage a household on their own because of this environment that they grew up in. It was more like they were taking care of me as a foreigner who has no idea what life is like in this village than I was trying to help them or I was trying to take care of them. There were some nights where our only source of light after sunset were candles because the electricity was quite unpredictable. And to talk about lack of opportunities, I feel like this is something very challenging to talk about because most people would assume it's because they don't try hard enough. So I'd like to tell you the story of one of my closest friends in the village. His name is Najib. Najib is 21 years old, and he is one of the most dedicated and hardworking person I've ever met. 
He self-taught himself how to speak Arabic, Japanese, Portuguese, as well as how to play the drums and the trombones. He has a lot of interest in learning things about Thailand and Thai culture. By now, he knows how to cook masaman, panang, and green curry. And he's also very interested in learning Muay Thai moves because he's a big fan of a movie called Ong Ba. And Najib aspires to be a musician one day. He wants to go to a music school abroad because music studies in Uganda isn't very advanced yet. And when I first heard about it, I thought, okay, it shouldn't be that hard for him because Uganda is an English-speaking country and Najib has a bunch of cool stories to tell to the admissions committee. Why is it taking so long for him? Why hasn't it worked out yet? And that's also when I realized how limited my world was. Najib told me the story of how he once traveled two, three hours into the capital city. It's called Kampala. And he went all the way there just to look for a computer because he doesn't have a computer at home. And as he sat right there in front of the first computer he could find that day, it was still impossible for him to even try applying for a scholarship to go to university because the computer that he could find that day in the town was so outdated that it couldn't even load the website he needed for university. It was as if this was a basketball game and he's already been disqualified without having any chance to even set foot onto the game in the first place because maybe he wasn't wearing the proper shoes. This is something I call an opportunity gap. And this is something people in our world completely look over and take for granted. To be honest with you, I mean, a person like Najib, if he had this motivation somewhere else, maybe somewhere in a first world country, he's gonna go so far in life, but it just hasn't worked out for him yet because he's born in the so-called unluckier part of the world where rights and opportunities are not guaranteed for every single human being, but are considered unnecessary privileges. But despite all these issues that are surrounding them, an image that has stuck with me even until today is the happy and carefree attitude of Ugandans. I remember going to work one day and meeting my friend Jane, and she was really happy that day. She was singing and laughing and like practically almost dancing. So I asked her, Jane, like, what's up? Like, why are you so happy today? Did something special happen at home? And Jane told me, you know, Prima, this morning I had a really good banana. It was very yellow and it was very sweet. And I think I'm going to be happy for the entire day because of that banana. Do we have any Disney fans here? Does anyone like Disney? There's a movie called Lion King, and there's a song in Lion King called Hakuna Matata. And the lyrics of this song describes Hakuna Matata as, it means no worries for the rest of your days. It's a problem free philosophy, Hakuna Matata. And this is what I believe is the reason behind the Ugandan villagers' happiness. This philosophy was made clear to me during my second week in Uganda because there was an Ebola outbreak. Yes, I'm talking about the Ebola, the deadly contagious disease with a 90% death rate. It has spread into the country and all the news channels worldwide were broadcasting about it. I freaked out, my family and friends at home freaked out, and as pretty much the entire world was so worried for Uganda's survival, the villagers told me, oh, Ebola is an accident. Oh, 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 Ebola. We don't really talk about it here, it's okay. What is Ebola? Oh, it's that thing where people get sick, right? Well, I think it happened last year and about a hundred of people died. It's coming back again this year? Okay, so more people will die, but it's okay, it's not in our village yet. Don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Hakuna Matata. I realized that happiness is something very abstract. It's man-made and it's all in your head. It's not the same thing as well-being, 
but it doesn't depend on well-being either. You could be living a city life, bathing in warm showers, eating food from the delivery guy who comes straight to your door just to give you food, and still feel completely empty and miserable about life. So can we really say, though, that our life is better than theirs? But before we jump to a conclusion, I'd like to talk about this very special day that happened at work. I went on a home visit in the village as part of my volunteering work, and I went to visit this family of a single mother and her daughter. They live in a tiny brick house, and there was no windows in the house, so it was very dark, even during midday. The floor is made completely of dirt, and the daughter has a special condition in which she couldn't walk, so she lies awkwardly on the floor pretty much the entire day. And as my conversation goes on and on and on with the mother, she then revealed to me that both of them are currently infected with malaria. And I was very shocked about that because I've always been told by doctors at home to be very careful about malaria. As volunteers, we take daily tablets just to prevent this, this disease. We stay tightly tucked under our mosquito nets and we spray on mosquito sprays pretty much the entire day. So I assumed that the local people would be more concerned about this danger that is surrounding them, but apparently not. So I went back home that day and I talked to the head of the NGO that I was volunteering with that there is a family infected with malaria and that we should do something about it. He looked at me and he said, malaria? Oh, they'll probably die in their house. I, I was speechless. I mean, this guy is a Ugandan. He's been running an NGO for 20 years in his own village that he grew up in. And he's saying that we can just leave somebody to die in their house? Like, come on, what are you doing? So he explained to me, Prima, do you know how much one dose of malaria medicine cost? It's $10. With two of them infected, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna cost them $20. The mother is a single mother. She doesn't have any job. There's no way they can earn those $20 in time. They'll probably die in their house. So this is a side of Hakuna Matata I wasn't mentally prepared for. Reality is hard, a hard to swallow pill. And it, if reality was a hand, that hand slapped me so hard in the face I could hear my own neck cracking. But Hakuna Matata, okay, this idea may or may not be the best philosophy for you to live by in your world. But for the villagers living in an environment where me personally as a summer volunteer going there for an adventure find hard to bear, yet they're living their entire life like this, this philosophy could be their only chance of living life meaningfully. And by that, I mean not just to survive life day by day, but to actually make something meaningful about it. To conclude my speech, I'd like to remind you that if you don't like something about the world, you can always do something about it. Go out there, start something new. This is why a lot of people become volunteers and go out of their comfort zones. But of course you can't change all the wrongs there is in this world. So if you can't do anything about it, then you have to find a way to live with it. Make it a great day or not, the choice is yours. So make it a great life or not, the choice is also yours. Beba Lenio, thank you for listening. Thank you.